On May 24, 2015, Pope Francis published the encyclical letter Laudato Si on care for our common home. Exploring many of the themes from the encyclical and featuring interviews with some Canadians concerned about our common home, this video is a Canadian response. The encyclical takes its name from the invocation of St. Francis of Assisi. Laudato si, mi signore. Praise be to you, my Lord. Praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us. Nothing in this world is indifferent to us. In this encyclical, Pope Francis enters into dialogue with all people about our common home. He writes, I wish to address every person living on this planet. I urgently appeal then for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. We need a conversation which includes everyone, since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. We asked David Suzuki, geneticist and host of CBC's The Nature of Things, to comment on Pope Francis's approach to science in the encyclical. What he has done is in the best tradition of Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson was a writer, and what she did was look at the big picture. You know, generally we say, does DDT have an effect? Oh, well, what's the effect on this field? What Rachel Carson showed us was, yeah, you spray it on fields, but wind blows, the, uh, it rains, and you end up affecting fish and birds and human beings. Generally, science, scientists are so focused, they're only looking at it in that little bit. What he has done is broaden it out into a much broader context. I think he's done something very, very profound. And uh, the science, as far as I'm concerned, is impeccable. In Chapter 1, Pope Francis declares that exposure to atmospheric pollutants impacts health, especially of the poor, and that these problems are linked to a throwaway culture which reduces things to rubbish. But it is climate change that has become the most compelling issue in this encyclical. The climate is a common good, belonging to all and meant for all. At the global level, it is a complex system linked to many of the essential conditions for human life. The Pope then describes the climate change crisis facing the planet today. In scientific detail, he describes how greenhouse gases, created in large part by the burning of fossil fuels, build up in the atmosphere and hamper the escape of heat produced by sunlight on the Earth's surface. The globe is heating up. In 1988, People were very, very concerned about global warming. I interviewed uh, Lucien Bouchard, who was the brilliant politician that Brian Mulroney was re-elected in 88, appointed Lucien. I said, what is the most critical issue that we have to face? And he said, right away, global warming. I was very impressed. 1988, I said, how serious is it? And his answer was, and these are his words, it threatens the survival of our species. We have to act now. 1988, Stephen Lewis chaired some sessions of 300 climatologists meeting at the University of Toronto. They were so concerned about climate change, they said in a press release, this is a threat to human survival second only to nuclear war, and called for a 20% reduction in 15 years. That was a call. Scientists had said it. The evidence was in. We've been going backwards ever since. So people knew that global warming was a serious threat and we're ready to act on it. Now, all of the, the years since, I have been backpedaling trying to say, look, the evidence is in, climate change is happening, here's the evidence. The denial has been getting stronger and stronger. Why? It's been coming from the fossil fuel industry. So finally now, I think we've turned a corner, but in terms of our government, we've had 10 years of a government that hasn't even mentioned climate change as an issue, a serious issue. And it's an issue not only of our survival, it's an issue of enormous economic implications. So uh, 
when I see the, the encyclical, I go, hallelujah, I'm an atheist, but I, I glory in what the Pope has done. Fresh drinking water is an issue of primary importance since it is indispensable for human life and for supporting terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Well, I think it's wonderful that Pope Francis zeroes in right away or very early in the encyclical on water. But he also, of course, places the concept of caring for Mother Earth um, within all of our other parts of our lives, cultural, social, economic, spiritual, and so on. He doesn't separate it off. He doesn't say that's the environment and, and it's over here. He says it's all one. And I think that's an, a radical, wonderful, poetic, necessary vision in our time. Um, he particularly singles out water, which is uh, in incredibly important because we are a planet running out of water and the growing crisis of the inequality and in inequitable access to water is one that is with us, not just in the global south anymore, but in the global north as well. So he sees this, he names it, and he, he takes action or directs us to take action to make this different. Even as the quality of available water is constantly diminishing, in some places there is a growing tendency, despite its scarcity, to privatize this resource, turning it into a commodity subject to the laws of the market. We try to get the message out about the human rights to water and sanitation in, in, in many ways, from very top down at the United Nations where I served as a senior advisor to uh, the 63rd President of the General Assembly, getting the United Nations to recognize water and sanitation as human rights, right down into working with most local grassroots communities here in Canada and around the world and every other level. We're trying here in Canada to get decent legislation. Our government, successive governments have ignored water um, or cut uh, legislation and regulations about water and we take our water totally for granted in Canada. We kind of have this notion that we love our water but in fact we don't care for it at all legally. Um, so at every single level there are things to be done from teaching children how to care about love and preserve water to provincial, national and international law to protect water. We have to do it at all levels because we are a planet running out of clean water. The Earth's resources are also being plundered because of short-sighted approaches to the economy, commerce and production. The loss of forests and woodlands entails the loss of species, which may constitute extremely important resources in the future, not only for food, but also for curing disease and other uses. The encyclical is brilliant science. Other species provide us with the very things that we need to survive, clean air, clean water, clean soil and food and clean energy. And so long as we regard them as just resources, then we will exploit them without a second thought. But regarding them as our relatives, as, as beings that have every right to exist on this planet, means that we treat them in a very different way. We have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment, so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. You know, we looked at liberation theology in terms of the cries of the poor, but now we're talking about the cries of the earth and both the cries of the poor and the cries of the earth are the voice of God. Are we responding to those cries? In chapter two, the Pope proposes a dialogue. Science and religion with their distinctive approaches to understanding reality, can enter into an intense dialogue fruitful for both. In a section called The Light Offered by Faith, 
he affirms the importance of both science and religion. If we are truly concerned to develop an ecology capable of remedying the damage we have done, no branch of the sciences and no form of wisdom can be left out, and that includes religion and the language particular to it. Pope Francis reminds us that we are not God, and that the earth was here before us and has been given to us. We must reject the incorrect interpretation of having dominion over the earth, and recognize that scripture advises us to till and keep the garden of the world. Sister Gertie Josh, a Sister of Charity of Halifax, works on Canada's west coast at the Living Language Institute Foundation, presenting workshops entitled Programs in Earth Literacies based on the work of theologian Thomas Berry. She reflects on the phrase, to till and keep. Keep means that we, we celebrate and we um, participate with the soil in a reciprocal relationship. And it's a spiritual experience actually to work in the soil. When we put our hands in the soil and reflect on the billions of species that are in that handful of soil, it's, it's, it's awe and it's gratitude for what's there. So it's a, it's, it's a responsibility and it's um, a relationship. We care for the soil, the soil cares for us. It's back and forth. Father Bill Clark is the spiritual director at the Ignatius Jesuit Centre in Guelph, Ontario. He describes the significance of the organic farm on the property. We, we're being more and more intentional now about integrating the whole uh, sustainable agriculture, the environment, with our spirituality. So you can't have good Christian spirituality without a deep awareness of the earth and, and the needs and the suffering of the earth as well. So it's become one part of our formation for people. And along with that then, we have these CSA gardens where people come and pick up their vegetables uh, once a week. They, they sort of buy into the farming project. Plus, we have a whole number of plots where people from the city can come out and have their own little gardens or their own large gardens. It's wonderful to see them on the weekends with their children, you know, out there gardening and teaching their children about gardening at the same time. So it's, it's a part of our mission, really. But if you see it all as being sacred, if you see the trees and the birds and the water and the mountains and the whole thing as all being sacred, then you're entitled to play your role in it. You're entitled to have your part in it. You're not expected to starve, but, um, but you're see, you see yourself as part of that overall fabric and as having an interest, both for yourself and for others, um, in the preservation of that fabric. That's a, I, I see that as being something towards which the Pope seems to be moving in that, in that phrasing. And, and if there's a rapprochement between the spirituality of the First Nations and the spirituality of the Western European settlers in this country, man, that is a huge, huge reason for hope. Later in chapter two, Pope Francis reflects on the story of Noah in Genesis. These ancient stories full of symbolism bear witness to a conviction which we today share, that everything is interconnected, and that genuine care for our own lives and our relationships with nature is inseparable from fraternity, justice, and faithfulness to others. And I think of it in terms of the evolutionary uh, story, the, the story of the universe, that we have a profound relationship with everything, that we actually are 13.8 billion years old. We're part of everything that's come before us. And we're in, we're in relationship with everything. We're in relationship with air, with the water, with uh, one another, with bees, with elf, elephants, with the sand, the soil that we live on. That's what I understand to be everything to be interconnected. It's a profound relationship and it's, it's all mind boggling that we are relations with everything. In the last section of chapter two, entitled The Gaze of Jesus, Pope Francis affirms the central role of the life of Jesus to Christian believers. In the Christian understanding of the world, the destiny of all creation is bound up with the mystery of Christ. Present from the beginning, all things have been created through him and for him.
Humanity has entered a new era in which our technical prowess has brought us to a crossroads. We are the beneficiaries of two centuries of enormous waves of change. It is right to rejoice in these advances and to be excited by the immense possibilities which they continue to open up before us, for science and technology are wonderful products of a God-given human creativity. However, Pope Francis warns us. The basic problem goes even deeper. It is the way that humanity has taken up technology and its development according to an undifferentiated and one-dimensional paradigm. He's also critiquing the method that we go about policy making, relying so much on what he calls the scientific or the technological paradigm. And it's through that paradigm that, that uh, political leaders and so forth tend to look at uh, how, to, how to come up with policies and everything. So everything gets reduced to a number. It is this paradigm that promotes the idea of infinite and unlimited growth. But there comes a point where there really is a limit. There really is only so much of these various, uh, I don't like to call them resources, but that's what they're normally called. And, uh, uh, you know, and at some point you, you, you run out of them. And if you don't run out of them in terms of supply, you run out of them in terms of places to put things. I mean, you know, the Earth's air is now telling us there's a limit to what can be put into the, into the air with a grave damage to all of life. Later in Chapter 3, the encyclical identifies modern anthropocentrism as a root of the problem of climate change. What he did was he cut right through, he cut through some of the history of the Catholic Church too. He cut right through all of that and said that we are anthropocentric, we are turned unto ourselves, when in fact we have to recognize that what we're dealing with here is life as a living organism and we're talking about living organisms the earth itself is a living organism and we have got to find ways of re-engaging with mother earth we've got to find ways of re-engaging with that living organism often what was handed on was a promethean vision of mastery over the world which gave the impression that the protection of nature was something that only the faint-hearted cared about instead our dominion over the universe should be understood more properly in the sense of responsible stewardship. And I was thrilled to see the Pope saying, this is not the correct understanding of dominion. And, and I'm, you know, I, mean, I don't know the actual textual background into the Greek and the Hebrew and so forth, but, um, but dominion in English does tend to mean mastery. And for him to say, no, it's not mastery, it's stewardship, all of a sudden I start to see Christian thought moving. See, this is what I meant by saying that there has to be a spiritual leadership which rooted, is rooted in a, an apprehension of reality as we now understand it. We now know, most of us recognize, um, that that kind of dominion over the earth as it was understood in the old days is false and is leading us into a trap that will kill us along with everything else. So we need a reinterpretation and we need it from a figure of authority and I was just thrilled that the Pope was um, um, was undertaking that very necessary task. Discussions are needed in which all those directly or indirectly affected farmers, consumers, civil authorities, scientists, seed producers, people living near fumigated fields and others can make known their problems and concerns and have access to adequate and reliable information in order to make decisions for the common good present and future. This is a chance to change everything. Everything has to change. And the fundamentals of life itself and our way of doing things in terms of our politics, our economics, as well as our relationship to nature and the environment have to fundamentally change. In Chapter 4, Pope Francis pulls together the notions of environmental, economic, and social ecologies. Based on a definition of the root concept of ecology as the study of the relationship between living organisms and the environment in which they develop, Pope Francis coins a new type of ecology which he calls integral ecology.
somehow we, he brought it home by talking about something called integral ecology. And what he meant by that was that everything is connected. And certainly everything that's living is connected. And that means that uh, humans are connected with animals, are connected with the plant life. And to leave ourselves in isolation, to disconnect us, to break us off into little parts and pieces, we lose any kind of connection with our common home. Many intensive forms of environmental exploitation and degradation not only exhaust the resources which provide local communities with their livelihood, but also undo the social structures which, for a long time, shaped cultural identity and their sense of the meaning of life and community. The Pope urges us to show special care for indigenous communities and their cultural traditions. They are not merely one minority among others, but should be the principal dialogue partners, especially when large projects affecting their land are proposed. I think it's an important reflection and understanding of um, just how specific the, the situation of indigenous peoples are in this world and how much they're impacted uh, in particular by climate change. Um, but also by the, the very things that cause climate change. So a lot of fossil fuel extraction or uh, deforestation for agriculture, for example, uh, as well as even a lot of the proposed impacts of climate change, or sorry, the proposed solutions of climate change, things like mega dams or biofuel plantations. Uh, these are all things that have had a lot of devastating impacts on uh, indigenous communities. Um, in many cases, you know, sometimes they've presented life or death scenarios for these communities. We have. Uh, indigenous communities on, that live on islands, for example, that you know, are threatened to disappear entirely and their people's way of life and, and culture and history with them. Um, so I think it's, it's really a, a reflection of the fact that you know, a lot of these indigenous peoples have a very much more vested interest um, in you know, trying to work to, to stop climate change and also proposing solutions that are uh, actually going to be sustainable and beneficial to all in the long run. The next theme is Ecology of Daily Life, where Pope Francis proposes that authentic development includes efforts to bring about an integral improvement in the quality of human life, and this entails considering the setting in which people live their lives. For the greater majority of Canadians, that would mean cities, and one city that was singled out by Pope Francis and invited to participate in the Global Conference on Climate Change was Vancouver. We have a commitment as a city to be the greenest in the world by 2020 and this is a, a commitment that I put forward when I first ran for mayor so it's been part of my uh, political uh, passion and commitment and it's been supported now three elections uh, successfully putting a team in place to carry out that goal and that, that goal is now supported broadly in the city. We've had tens of thousands of people working on different elements of the greenest city goals it's like a decathlon for us, whether it's air or water or local food, reducing our climate pollution, uh, transportation, creating green jobs. We have uh, 10 different metrics and targets that we're tracking to get to the 2020 goal of being the greenest and, and to inspire other cities around the world to be part of this, uh, raising the bar, raising the level around the world in cities to be much more sustainable. It was an enormous honor to be the only Canadian mayor invited and to represent our country uh, with the Pope and to, to bring the stories from Canada and from Vancouver specifically and share them with mayors from other big cities around the world that Pope Francis ha had invited together. So we, uh, we've recommitted ourselves to working very hard to push on our national leaders to make bold commitments to fight climate change and modern slavery. And, in the months ahead. Uh, this is an enormously important piece of work for mayors around the world and we're very encouraged to have uh, Papa Francisco supporting and inspiring these efforts globally. In Chapter 5, the encyclical describes the world as interdependent and proposes that solutions for climate change should be made from a global perspective. 
We know that technology based on the use of highly polluting fossil fuels, especially coal, but also oil and to a lesser degree gas, needs to be progressively replaced without delay. Pope Francis laments the failure of world summits on reducing greenhouse gases. He cites some successful international agreements, like the Basel Convention on Hazardous Wastes and the Vienna Convention for Protection of the Ozone Layer through the Montreal Protocol. However, on climate change, Pope Francis is unequivocal. Reducing greenhouse gases requires honesty, courage and responsibility, above all on the part of those countries which are more powerful and pollute the most. The Conference of the United Nations on Sustainable Development, Rio Plus 20, Rio de Janeiro 2012, issued a wide-ranging but ineffectual outcome document. International negotiations cannot make significant progress due to positions taken by countries which place their national interests above the global common good. But it's also something else, and he says this very clearly in, in one of his uh, 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 sections where he talks about the rise of corporate power and the power of, um, of corporations. They have had a huge influence in shaping public policies of national governments. And it's private gain, it's uh, national interest redefined as private gain and in terms of the maximization of profits and things like that, that has got a hold of the political perspective and that has to fundamentally change. Um, so I think, I think there is a lot of hope when you look at a lot of the, the, the you know, people that are doing a lot of really incredible stuff, a lot of these kind of movements, a lot of these kind of um, folks from around the world that really, you know, demand, uh, are starting to demand, you know, very strong action. Uh, even from a lot of countries, you have a lot of uh, countries uh, that really are demanding strong action. But, you know, when you look at um, how that's being turned into, you know, inaction, um, in the halls of, of governments, in the halls of, of, of the way the businesses are doing operations still, uh, I think that, you know, what we really need to see is, is a change in, in how those kind of uh, systems are done and a change in, in terms of who's in power and how that power is, is really reflected. The myopia of power politics delays the inclusion of a far-sighted environmental agenda within the overall agenda of governments. True statecraft is manifest when, in difficult times, we uphold high principles and think of the long-term common good. To take up these responsibilities and the costs they entail, politicians will inevitably clash with the mindset of short-term gain and results which dominates present-day economics and politics. I certainly think that uh, it's accurate assessment of the problem we have in politics and government where, where it's short term it's it's one term at a time and a very short term commitments made by politicians to get elected and be popular but I, I think we've uh, we've we're at a time where that's that's actually very destructive and we need to shift and there needs to be political leadership that's thinking long term and acting for the big picture and I think we're seeing that shift happening in cities right now we're seeing lots of mayors uh, come to the forefront with the leadership to act for the long term in the best interests of humanity. But we're not seeing that at the national level. We're seeing many national leaders afraid to act and to take uh, bold action to deal with climate change and to deal with uh, global poverty and modern slavery. Pope Francis opens the final chapter reminding us that consumerism is a conditioned reflex, but that we have choices and that we should examine our lifestyles. He quotes the Earth Charter to illustrate his request of us. As never before in history, common destiny beckons us to seek a new beginning. Let ours be a time remembered for the awakening of a new reverence for life the firm resolve to achieve sustainability, the quickening of the struggle for justice and peace, and the joyful celebration of life. I really love in the Earth Charter that's quoted in the encyclical 
the idea that we need to be brought more into a joyful celebration of life. And I think that the Pope understands by talking about daily gestures that this is not just about getting into people's homes, but it's about getting into people's hearts and really taking advantage of the unique human capacity for wonder and bringing that more into our everyday actions. So I often hesitate to use the word education to describe the work that I do. Not because I don't really value education as an important part of the ways in which humans interact with each other and the world around us, but because I think that we sometimes fall into a trap of understanding education as just providing information. And that leads us to believe that as long as people have the right information, they'll do the right thing. When in fact, that's not the case. It actually requires making contact with people's values to open the door to change, not just telling them the facts. And that's really what I try to do in the work that my team and I undertake. We make an effort to actually change people's habits and behaviors. Something I found beautiful in the encyclical was the Pope's call for a, a system of daily gestures that break with paradigms of violence and exclusion. And I think that that is what drives and motivates actually the work that we do. It's this desire to institute a system of habits that prioritize communion, a, a more sustainable relationship with energy, and a celebration of the beauty of daily life. Environmental education means a change in our daily habits. A person who could afford to spend and consume more, but regularly uses less heating and wears warmer clothes, shows the kind of convictions and attitudes which help to protect the environment. There is a nobility in the duty to care for creation through little daily actions. Sister Maura McGrath of the Congregation of Notre Dame in Montreal explains how an organization called the Green Church is helping her community to care for creation through daily actions. Well, the Green Church is an organization that does exactly that, tries to help organizations lighten our footprint. And we have uh, been working with the founder since March. He came to, to do a, a workshop excellent. He's a scientist and a man of faith. We also, before he came, measured our, our carbon footprint, which is very heavy in an institution. So we, are, we now have a green committee in the Mother House made up of employees and some sisters, and we hope to be able to effect some change to help make us greener, help lighten our footprint on our earth. Pope Francis calls for ecological conversion. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It is not an optional or secondary aspect of our Christian experience. Well, if spirituality is a way of life based on or flowing from who we think we are, our dignity, certainly an ecological spirituality calls us to make a huge shift and to look at all reality through the eyes of our Mother Earth. And our Indigenous people have that wisdom, all is sacred, all is sacrament. And the Pope is really calling us not to add on the Earth, but to look at all, all reality, all the issues, and to hear the cry of the poor in the Earth as the one cry. Pope Francis ends Laudato Si with a Christian prayer in union with creation. The final stanza captures the essence of his encyclical. The poor and the earth are crying out. O Lord, seize us with your power and light. Help us to protect all life, to prepare for a better future, for the coming of your kingdom of justice, peace, love, and beauty. Praise be to you, Laudato Si. Amen. Franciscus. <laughs>